Welcome back to Black Poets Then and Now. My name is Kara Roseborough, and today I'm happy to talk to you about the life and work of Gwendolyn Brooks. Gwendolyn Elizabeth Brooks was born in Topeka, Kansas in 1917. When she was six weeks old, she and her parents moved to Chicago as part of the Great Migration. Her father, David Anderson Brooks, was a janitor for a music company. At one point, he was an aspiring doctor, but took the time to get married and raise his family. Her mother, Keziah Wims Brooks, was a school teacher and a concert pianist trained in classical music. Brooks began her education at Forest Bell Elementary School on the south side of Chicago. She went on to attend Hyde Park High School, which at the time was a prestigious integrated school with a predominantly white student body population. After struggling with racism and discrimination there, she transferred to the all-black Wendell Phillips High School. She ended up transferring once again and graduating from Englewood High School. During these formative years, Brooks began to write, and her mother encouraged her. Her mother said that she could be the female Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Brooks began submitting work in her teen years, and when she was just 13 years old, she published her first poem, Eventide, in the American Childhood magazine. By the time Brooks was 16 years old, she published roughly 75 poems. At age 17, she submitted her work to the Lights and Shadows column of the Chicago Defender, a prominent African-American publication. Her work was accepted, and by the time she graduated from high school, she was a regular contributor. She continued to publish work while in college. She was known for writing in many styles, including ballads, sonnets, and most notably, free verse poems with blues rhythms. Brooks received commendations for her early work from noted writers such as James Weldon Johnson, Richard Wright, and Langston Hughes. Johnson gave Brooks her first critique when she was just 16 years old. Hughes heard Brooks read her poem, The Ballad of Pearl May Lee, while she was in a workshop with affluent literary educator Inez Cunningham Stark. In 1944, Brooks published two poems in the noted Poetry Magazine. In 1945, she published her first book of poetry, A Street in Bronzeville, after a strong letter of support from Richard Wright to his publisher. Brooks received critical acclaim for A Street in Bronzeville, with particular praise for her authenticity and textured portraits of life in the Bronzeville, Chicago neighborhood. When asked about her work, Brooks said that she enjoyed getting inspiration from the urban life around her. In 1946, she got her first Guggenheim Fellowship and was named one of the 10 Women of the Year in Mademoiselle magazine. In 1949, she published her sophomore book of poetry, Annie Allen, which not only earned her the Eunice Tijans Award handed out by a poetry magazine, but earned her the Pulitzer Prize making her the first African-American to win this prestigious award. In 1953, Brooks published Maud Martha, her only novel, which was 34 vignettes about a woman's life journey, her struggles with racism and injustice outside of the Black community, as well as colorism within the Black community and internal struggles with identity and purpose. Seven years later, in 1960, she published her third book of poetry, The Bean Ears, which features one of her most popular poems, We Real Cool. In 1967, Brooks attended the second Black Writers Conference, where she was exposed to the new wave of Black cultural nationalism and adopted a Black nationalist posture. Being exposed to prominent leaders in that movement at the conference inspired Brooks to take other literary ventures, including teaching creative writing to members of the Blackstone Rangers gang. The following year, in 1968, she published her long-form poem, In the Mecca, which was one of her most famous poems and earned her the nomination for the National Book Award for Poetry. Brooks published two autobiographical works during her life, The Report from Part One, published in 1972, and The Report from Part Two, published in 1995 when she was almost 80 years old. She spent a great deal of the latter part of her career teaching all across the country and here in Illinois at the University in Chicago, Columbia College, and Chicago State University. She was also a mentor to many new and up-and-coming poets. Brooks led a relatively quiet home life. 
She met her husband, Henry Lowington Blake Jr. at the Chicago NAACP Youth Council. The two married in 1939, had two children, and spent their lives living in Chicago. Brooks died at 83 years old in December of 2000 after struggling with cancer. It is a great testament to her career that her work continues to resonate with contemporary audiences. Today, we'll look at two of her iconic poems, The Bean Eaters and We Real Cool. They eat beans mostly, this old yellow pear. Dinner is a casual affair. Plain chipware on a plain and creaking wood tin flatware. Two who are mostly good. Two who have lived their day, but keep on putting on their clothes and putting things away. And remembering. Remembering with twinklings and twinges as they lean over the beans in their rented back room that is full of beads and receipts and dolls and cloths, tobacco crumbs, vases, and fringes. All right, let's unpack. This is a lyric poem with jazz rhythms. The jazz rhythms give the poem an uneven feeling because there's no organized meter, which you can see visually on the page and then hear it and feel it when you read the poem aloud. Let's look at that first stanza and then we'll come back to the title at the very end. They eat beans mostly, this old yellow pear. Beans are a staple food item. They eat that mostly, possibly meaning that they can't afford much else. This old yellow pear. So we've got the subject of the poem. Yellow can be emphasizing one of two things here. Yellow can be emphasizing the fact that they're old. It can also be uh, in reference to their skin tone. As back in the day, yellow was used to describe black people with a lighter skin tone. Moving on. Their dinner is a casual affair. Not a lot of fanfare, not a lot of fancy food or fancy cutlery, which we see in the last two lines of this stanza plain chipware on a plain and creaking wood tin flatware. So everything around them, it's not super fancy. Kind of get the idea that they're pretty poor. Moving on to the next stanza. Two who are mostly good, two who have lived their day but keep on putting on their clothes and putting things away. Mostly good is capitalized here, which reminds me of a lot of biblical ca capitalizations. He, God, Jesus, etc leading the reader to believe that this couple, in being mostly good, has lived a virtuous, possibly religious life. Two who have lived their day. So they've gone through youth and adolescence and young adulthood and every other stage, and now they're at this latter stage here. But keep on putting on their clothes and putting things away. They keep on going through the daily motions. They are committed to that. Last stanza. And remembering. Remembering with twinklings and twinges as they lean over the beans in their rented back room that is full of beads and receipts and dolls and cloths, tobacco crumbs, vases, and fringes. And remembering, ellipses, dot, dot, dot. This for me is one of the most emotional lines in the whole poem. The poem itself is emotional, but not because of figurative language, simply for the facts that the speaker is presenting. But and remembering is, differs in style from the rest of the poem, it immediately evokes a sense of nostalgia. What are they remembering? Twinklings and twinges, the good and the bad, the ups and the downs, the hills and the valleys. As they lean over their beans, I love that image of leaning over the beans because it emphasizes the base need, the hunger, um, rather than, again, some formal affair. It's a casual affair. It's about getting in that daily bread. In their rented back room, this old couple at the end of their life live in a place that they don't own. They rent this place and it's not a house or an apartment. It's one room and it's a back room. I think that says a lot about the circumstances that they're in, given the life that they've led, that it has not rewarded them with something more. Last two lines. Um, this back room is full of beads and receipts and dolls and cloths, tobacco crumbs, vases and fringes. These kind of feel like really random things that allude to other things that may have come and gone in their lives and they're left with these scraps, these pieces. And these things on their own may not have a lot of value, but they are automatically uh, infused with more value simply because these are the things that they own in a life where they own so little. Going back to the title, the bean eaters. Brooks defines this couple 
by calling them the bean eaters, defining them by their circumstances, by the very thing that they eat that represents the poverty that they live in. Next, we'll look at We Real Cool. The pool players, seven at the golden shovel. We real cool, we left school, we lurk late, we strike straight, we sing sin, we thin grin, we jazz June, we die soon. So before the couplet gets started, this is mostly written in a couplet, Brooks gives us characters, speakers, and a setting. The pool players, seven at the golden shovel. And in this one, we've got it written in italics. This poem is stylized in a lot of different ways, depending on the publication or, you know, where you're finding the poem. But in this one, we've got it italicized um, as if it's in a play and you have the setting before the dialogue gets started. Moving on to the first stanza. We real cool. We left school. We. Right here, we're given roughly an age group. Pool players that are supposed to be in school that have left school. And in doing so, we not only get an age group, but we get what kind of people these pool players are. The kind that leave school, the kind that don't take things seriously or don't invest in themselves, don't take that time seriously. They lurk late, they're out on the street, they strike straight, sing sin. I love this phrase, sing sin. Not only are they doing bad things, but they're doing it in a carefree and joyous manner. Moving down to Jazz June. Jazz June, she turns jazz into a verb. And if we're taking it to, uh, in relation to jazz as a style of music, it can be chaotic, it can be fun, it takes the classical and willingly breaks the rules, bends the rules, twists them. And that's actively what these kids are doing by doing all of the aforementioned things. The poem ends with Die Soon, which has a lot of impact not only in the content of Dying Soon, but also by breaking the structure of the poem. It just has die soon. It doesn't have we afterwards. Double punch right there. The speakers in this poem on reflecting are reflecting on who they are and their actions. They're not passing judgment, but the forthright manner in which they talk about these things actually conveys a sense of pride. In this meditation, I believe that Brooks is really commenting on the lack of investment uh, that certain kids have in their futures and how that fast track, that fast life, is also quickly leading to their death. It is possibly a physical death, but a metaphorical death as well, by staying stagnant. Thank you so much for tuning in today to Black Poets Then and Now. We will be back on Thursday for more poetry. Until then, stay safe and stay creative. Bye!